Um, as you know, by now, in case you haven't heard it four times, my name is Rhonda Cochran, and today I'm going to talk to you about self-doubt, which happens to be, at this very moment, something I am full of. <laughs> other people that know me may think I'm full of other things, and they would be accurate, but I want to talk to you specifically about the power of self-doubt. Webster's Dictionary defines self-doubt as a lack of confidence in one's reliability, one's own motives, personality, and thought. Interesting. My definition in my dictionary is a lack of self-confidence in the vastness of one's own creativity, one's ability, one's brilliance, one's strength, one's courage, one's personality, and one's badassness. Now, I suspect what you're thinking is that last word isn't really a word. Guess what? I don't really have my own dictionary. So I'm going to take a little bit of creative license on this. Now, I'm not talking about the kind of self-doubt that has you questioning your ability to bungee jump without a safety rope. And I'm not talking about the self-doubt that has you questioning your ability to be a horse jockey at 6'2". Because frankly, that's common sense. Both of those things are safe for you and for the horse. Instead, I'm talking about the kind of self-doubt that is invisible to other people, but often cripples you and plays a role in the decisions that you make every single day. I bet everybody in this room at one time or another has felt that they weren't good enough, that they didn't measure up, that they weren't capable of something they wanted to do. I'd like everybody right now just to stop and take a moment and think of a time where self-doubt stopped you. Now, whether that was opening a door you were afraid of, going to school, leaving a job, whatever it is, I want you to find that in your head right now, the time that self-doubt stopped you, and hang on to that, because we're going to come back to it a little bit later. Now, where does self-doubt come from? Self-doubt can come from an internal sense of unworthiness, and as other speakers have spoken about today, it can come from external resources, such as an unloving parent who taught you that you weren't good enough. Perhaps it came from an overly protective parent, one that needed to keep you small and safe because of their own fear. Or it came from friends and family, or as others have spoken about today, from media. We are bombarded on a daily basis of images of what we're supposed to look like, where we're supposed to live, what success is supposed to be. And every time that we don't measure up to that, even if we don't realize it on a, sub, on a conscious level, on a subconscious level, that plants more doubt in us because we aren't measuring up. So whether your self-doubt comes from an internal source, yourself, or an external, your bombardment, it's powerful. I really want people to understand that it's powerful. For me, self-doubt okay, has played a very big role in my life. 23 years, seven months, and six days ago, I was at a pivotal point in my life. I was at a point where a decision had to be made, namely, to take my own life, or to live clean and sober. And I doubted that I could do that. As a matter of fact, every part of me doubted I could do that. I started using alcohol as a coping mechanism at a very early age. And what once started as a maladaptive strategy turned into a full-blown addiction. And that addiction, along with my own self-doubt, kept me sick for a long time. So here I was, having to decide, on one hand, to take my own life, or on the other hand, to live, but not really have a life, because that's all I had known was alcohol and substances. And when I imagined a life without those, I imagined a life of loneliness, of spinsterhood, and of knitting. And that, you know what, frankly, didn't sound like that much of a life for me. So here's another thing about my self-doubt, is it was really insidious. It was really tricky stuff, because it had me not only doubting my ability to ever get clean and sober, 
it had me questioning my ability to take my life effectively. So I was screwed no matter which way I turned. I needed to make a choice. So I made a deal with myself, with the universe, and with God, if you will. And notice I said I made a deal. I did not make a promise because by that point in my life, I had broken every promise I ever made. So I made a deal. I'll give this clean and sober thing a shot. And if it doesn't work, then I'm taking my life. But I will have tried. So on July 20th, 1993, I got out of bed and I poured every ounce of alcohol that I had in my house down the drain. And I walked into my first meeting. And as you can see, I'm standing here. So that clean and sober thing took. Um, initially, those first days, those weeks, those months, they were filled with loneliness. And I did knit a couple sweaters. <laughs> but ultimately, as I got stronger in my sobriety, my self-doubting voice got a little bit weaker in its ability and its power over me. And I thought, for somebody who has struggled with self-doubt her whole life, I thought, this is really empowering stuff. This is cool. Everybody should know about this. Right? I thought I had the world by the tail. But soon enough, I wasn't lonely anymore. And soon enough, I quit knitting. And soon enough, I started to have those dreams again of things that I wanted prior to getting clean and sober. And soon enough, that self-doubt came back. See, I had, I had dreams of being happy and successful. I had dreams of going to university, but I wasn't smart. You know, I had dreams of being a runner, but I wasn't athletic. I had dreams of teaching, but I didn't know anything. And I had dreams of helping people, but I was the one who needed help. And I had dreams of writing, but I didn't think I had anything to say. But those dreams and my self-doubt all stayed inside my head, where everything is safe, right? And where none of you can ever see any of that. Well, the universe is a fascinating thing because the second that you put something out there into it, it will conspire to make that happen. It will place people, places, and things in your path to see A, if you're determined to do it, and B, if you are, it's going to help you along the way. So you better be prepared for it. So I started to speak aloud about some of my dreams. And the first thing I thought I would do is run. I thought I'd start easy. How hard can running be? I saw runners. I, I imagined the way that they lived and the way they moved through their lives. And I wanted to be a runner. I had no idea what that actually meant. I just wanted to be it. So I figured I could start easy with that. So I would start on a Sunday night and get super jazzed and committed about starting a running program on Monday. Monday would roll around, I'd get up and put my running shoes on and I'd go out the door. And my self-doubt would trail behind. And for anybody who's ever started a running program, running is not easy. Running sucks. <laughs> and running is really hard. I would take three or four steps and my self-doubt would catch up beside me. And I'd say, why are you doing this? This is ridiculous. You're not athletic. You can't run. I'd keep going. I'd persevere. And then it would say, it's too hot out. It's raining. You don't like to sweat. Stop this nonsense. This is crazy. Your knees are going to hurt. Nobody is going to like you if you become a runner. <laughs> Ultimately, I would give up on my running dream. So let me to recap. Monday morning, I would have a running plan. Monday morning, my running plan would be done. About this time, I had also gotten married. And my um, now ex-husband, bless his soul, got sick and tired of hearing me talk about my commitment to running, to a new fitness, to a new way of being, only to come home on Monday to hear about the misery of failure again. So he bought me a running clinic in this very town, by the way, and it was the first one in this town back in 1996. And that set a whole bunch of other things in motion. I ended up meeting a friend there who ultimately gave me a job in an organization that I am still in, but that's a sidebar. The running part, I still had the challenge of getting over all that self-doubt that came with it. So I would go out and I would start running, and I would remember running isn't quite as serious as my self-doubt and sobriety was. So if I could shut my self-doubt out, out or up, 
to get sober, certainly I could do it to run, because running isn't life and death. So I started to build on that one success of beating myself out. And that built into five minutes, and that built into five miles, and that built into marathons, and that built into triathlons, and that built into Ironman races. Which, you know what? That's not too bad for somebody who can't swim, bike, or run, and isn't athletic. <laughs> so I started to, again, notice this shift every time that I would apply previous success to my current self-doubt. So next thing I wanted to do while I was going, while I was working, I wanted to go to university. By this time, I'm a very mature student. So my self-doubt, the first thing it says is, A, you're not smart enough to go to university, which is ironic, because that's where you go to get smart <laughs> and to learn stuff. Second thing is I was too old to go to university, right? I'd be the oldest person there, people would laugh at me, nobody would want to go and drink with me, and I couldn't drink anyways if they did want to. You know, all these things would come up for me. Again, I applied that one success of being clean and sober and telling my self-doubt to shut up. And I went to university, I learned some stuff, and I got me some smarts. Since then, I've climbed the corporate ladder, I've taught, I've helped people, and I've started to write. It turns out I got a lot to say. You know, so I tell you that not because I am special in any way, shape, or form, because these things that I'm talking about as dreams are things that average people do every day. But anybody who's ever struggled in darkness or in self-doubt or in addiction knows that those dreams of everyday people are pretty big when you're caught in that despair and in that cyclical downward spiral. So I stand here before you today to tell you one thing that I think is really important. Your self-doubt is a voice that you can choose to listen to or not. You give your self-doubt power. Now again, I'm not suggesting that you don't listen to your self-doubt when you're about to bungee jump without the rope. But you don't need to feed it. You don't need to listen to it every time it tells you you can't do something. If I had listened to my self-doubting voice way back when, I wouldn't be standing here in front of you today. I would have never completed 15 marathons, three Ironman races. I never would have went to university. I never would have got married, divorced, and jumped out of a perfectly good plane. The last two have absolutely nothing to do with each other, by the way. <laughs> you know, I never, I never would have gone on to have the opportunities that I've had in my life. And my life has been pretty amazing. You know, I've had some great, great joys. And I've had some real lows and challenges. And I think Agatha Christie summarizes it best when she says that I like living. I have, been, I have sometimes been wildly despairing, acutely miserable, racked with sorrow. But through it all, I still know quite certainly that just to be alive is a grand thing. So I'm going to encourage you, whether you are 20 or you're 70, I'm going to ask you, can you afford one more day entertaining your self-doubt? Because I'll tell you something, the cliches they say, they're true. Life is short. It is going to be over before you're ready. So I encourage you to think about that thing again that you didn't do back then. Bring it back to your mind. And remember a few things. Remember that the universe will conspire with you. Remember that your self-doubt is going to conspire against you. Remember that it may lie to you. It may manipulate you. It may hold on to your ankles as you try to walk away. But know that you are stronger than your self-doubt. Know that you're the one that feeds the power. So put your power in other places in your life. I know a few things through my experience. I know that self-doubt will kill creativity, passion, ambition, and joy. It doesn't have to kill that in you. I know that self-doubt is only a choice to listen to or not to listen to. I know that you were born free of self-doubt, so don't die full of it. I know that you're here to inspire people 
and to leave your mark with your people. I know that you're here to live an inspired life. So whether you want to jump off a cliff with a safety rope, whether you want to go to university, you want to leave a bad relationship, you want to start your own business, I want you to do what this little fish is doing. I want you to be big. I want you to be brave. And I want you to leap to the next stage in your life. Because the last thing I know, I know on the other side of your self-doubt, your life is waiting for you. And I know you're going to totally, totally rock it. I have no doubt about that. Thank you.